oh Allah, you love a strong Muslim, you love a healthy Muslim, because it helps me with ibadah, it helps with confidence, it helps with, you know, the youth. You know, let's, let's just be real. If when a scholar comes and he looks like, you know, he looks hench and he looks strong, when the youth look at him, they're like, damn, this guy is like, you know, I can relate to this guy, right? Let's be honest. But if on the other hand, they're looking at a sheikh who's had way too many kebabs, you know, whatever the case may be, he looks like he's not taking this side of his life seriously. Their lifestyle is not great in terms of, you know, there's too much food, man, or there's not enough training or whatever. So the point here is, you know, when a youth sees someone like that, they're like, you know, this is someone I could look up to. You know, he's taking his uh, spiritual and physical uh, gifts seriously. Being on this podcast with you has been one of the greatest blessings I can ever imagine. Honestly, if only you knew. If only you knew. It's actually now, it's forcing me now not to, not to sound like a hypocrite and put some of these things in action now, right? <laughs> because I'm thinking... What have you been doing for the past few weeks or months? You need to get back on track, man. What's going on, Hamza, right? So this has been such... Wallahi, I could never think enough. There was a guy who asked the sheikh, it was an atheist, by the way, how are you going to feel if you die and you find out that, you know, there's no day of judgment, there's no heaven and hell, how are you going to feel? And the sheikh answered, I'm not going to feel as bad as you would when you find out there is. <laughs> hey, oh. yeah. And <laughs> at the end of the day, I'm not saying religion is fear mongering and Islam is fear mongering, but if you don't want to have fear of a love, your creator, and you want to be logically sold on religion, there's a lot of intellectuals, Hamza Zortzis, Muhammad Hijab, there's too many people, Subur Ahmed. Too many great scholars, too many great advocates of the truth, too many great cosmologists, too many great physicists, too many great even students of knowledge like Rami that are just out here doing their due diligence. So open your eyes and inshallah, God willing, you are guided to see the truth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not change the condition of a person until they change what's within themselves. So if you guys don't change what's within you, you're not going to get Allah's guidance. You're not going to get that. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome back to the realest podcast in the dunya, The Three Muslims. You guys asked for it. We brought him back. Hamza, Andreas, Zortis. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Zakhra for having me, guys. Man, it's been a while since we last spoke, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like what, five minutes? <laughs> we got the so same us, shirt on, too. Tell us what's yeah. new. You know, what's changed uh, since the weeks that we spoke? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, time is relative, so one may say it's been weeks, but uh, yeah, in the few minutes since we spoke, nothing much has changed apart from our topic and all the topics that we're going to be speaking about, right? Because today we're going to be speaking about what we're going to be speaking about. We're going to be speaking about martial arts, fitness, stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of philosophical and, and just spiritual values and lessons that we can extract and dissect. And absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I always say sometimes training really hard can be a, a good way of temporary, temporarily reducing the ego. Uh, I, let me give you a thought experiment for this. So if you watch boxing, right? So sometimes two guys, two heavyweights, especially in the older days, you know, say Lennox Lewis and Mike Tyson, they're at each other's throats. They're talking, they're swearing, they're, they're, they're being rude. But after 12 rounds of a good battering, they're hugging each other, they're kissing each other, they're saying sorry. And why why that change now let's assume the sincere that change happens is because when you go through a lot of physical stress mm. it can temporarily reduce the ego like i remember like so in ramadan i was i was going through the boxing training and just before iftar or before iftar i would train like i would train as hard i was trained any other time i mistimed me finishing training i believe and it was like 20 minutes before iftar i stopped 20 minutes before iftar and when you're training high intensity it's like madness that, those 20 minutes is, is a long time 
Um, and, you know, all you care about is having that water, right? You don't care about who spoke about you. You don't talk, you don't care about what you look like, how good you look, how right you are. You know, you don't want to impose yourself on anyone. You just want that water, right? And even like, if you go for a really tough bag session, like what I'm talking about, like you do 12 rounds, make it 30 second rest in between, make sure it's powerful rounds, keep on moving, head movement and leg movement continuously, combinations, three minute rounds, times 12, 30 second minute rest, you're finished. Or even if you would add more, more to it, no rest, but in between the one minute space between the rounds, do burpees, yeah? And then go back on the bag and you're finished. By the 12th round, you're like soup. <laughs> finished yeah uh, in that situation what you know sometimes I'll just be collapsed for example doing something similar and you know all I care about is just getting my breath back and getting some water and getting some I don't know a sugary drink or something you don't care about who said what about you you don't care about anything so in those situations sometimes there is a kind of like I don't know I wouldn't call it spirituality but I would call it, there is a an, an existential or I don't know, psychological aspect where you can use training to really connect with people. And that's why when you look at the psychology of training and you look at when people train together, especially when it's rugby or soccer or martial arts, there's a little bit of a brotherhood that goes on, right? I don't know if you, you know, you notice this yourself. There's a there's this kind of like almost unwritten social law that there's a type of connection that you guys have because you've seen yourselves in those vulnerable moments where there's not much ego left because you just completely finished and so much physical stress. Um, And it's in those moments that you can have really good conversations with people because it's the temporary reduction of the ego. Mm -hmm. So if you spar with someone for 12 rounds, a very hard sparring session, and you're both sitting on the, in the ring and you're leaning back on the ropes and you're having a recovery drink, that's the time to have a conversation about something. Yeah. Because the, your ego is lower. And when your ego is lower, then it's more easier for you to have conversations about things that really matter. Um, and yeah, so uh, training has that element. I don't know if you guys have experienced that. Oh, yeah, 100%. 100%. So you're basically telling us, you're telling everyone watching this to go into the gym, do a hard sparring session, and then give that dawa to the person when they're out of breath. Just drinking that water, drinking the, the sugary drink. Yeah, why not? Why not? Yeah, of why course. not, right? Yeah, because you're, you're, you're both finished. And you could do it in such a natural way. So if, if you are training in MMA, mixed martial arts, or kickboxing, or whatever it is, and, you're, and you have that relationship with them that they trust you anyway. Because for you to share a sparring session with someone, there's going to be an element of trust, especially if you've done it a few times together. So when, when you go through that, then you, you, you've totally physically exhausted yourself. And then you could start talking about, you know, look, look, man, we're just finished now. And like, nothing matters apart from this war. Look how weak we really are as human beings, right? Look how contingent we are. We're mm. dependent creatures, right? And, you know, doesn't our contingency and our dependency really cry out to the fact that there is something that is independent and necessarily existing? What do you mean? And then you could talk about a particular argument, for example, in a natural, easy way. Or you could just focus on, you know, some Quranic narratives on, you know, the, the, the human state and the human situation that, you know, when we're very haughty, we reject the truth and we think we have this self-sufficiency, right? Because self-sufficiency and this haughtiness is a barrier to divine grace and mercy. Um, and, you know, you could start talking about those things. So it depends. It has to be natural. It has to be part of the relationship and the dynamic that you've built with the person. But what I'm saying here is in the context of training, if you train very hard and you've gone through a sparring session or a fitness session and you're both just chilling now, that's actually a really good time to talk about these things because your ego is on the floor. You don't care about anything else apart from the water, right? So that's the kind of, you know, psychological dimension to training. There's also a spiritual one personally as well. Um, The way I like to see training hard is I like to see training whether it's weight training or martial arts or boxing or whatever the case may be i like to see that you should always try your utmost best from an ihsan point of view what, what i mean by this so yes we know ihsan means excellence and we know from a spiritual perspective it means that you're worshiping allah 
um, as if you can see him, but although you can't see him, he sees you, right? So this God consciousness, this awareness, Allah is 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 watching you, right? Imagine, you know, uh, your wife told you to wash the dishes, right? And then she had to go somewhere. I don't know, her mom was ill or something. And then you're washing the dishes. And some of us, would maybe, you know, we're a bit lazy, won't, won't do it properly. But if she had a camera in the kitchen, you'd be like, doing it properly with Ihsan and making, scrubbing everything, you know, stuff like that. So when, when you know someone's watching or someone is always aware, then there's that element of consciousness of that awareness that someone's aware of you, right? So uh, we know there's that element to it. But what I mean here is, from a fitness and martial arts point of view, is Ihsan of using all of the gifts Allah has given you, all of the capacity and ability has given to its maximum. I find it, and this is connected to shukr and gratitude. I find it a sense of ingratitude to Allah when someone doesn't try their best. Because Allah has given you these abilities and you don't even know where the limits are because you don't know uh, the will of Allah. Because the will of Allah is unknown in this situation. Mm. You could just keep on trying to explore your limits. But every time you find one limit and you, you pass that limitation, then you realize actually it was a self-imposed limitation. So the point here is we have abilities. We don't know where, the, where their limits are. When, if you try to maximize your ability all the time and maximize those skills and abilities Allah is giving you all the time without imposing a self-imposed limitation, because that is equivalent of saying, I know Allah's will about me. No, you don't. Allah knows about his will. You don't know. What's, you just, all you can do is keep on trying your best. So if you don't maximize and try your best, I find it as a sense, as I find it, it lacks ihsan, it lacks excellence, but it also lacks gratitude. That's how I see it. So, you know, when some people are going to the gym or they're going for a sparring session, they're just not really focusing or on the phone all the time, and they're not, you know, I'm like, what's wrong with this person? Allah has given this person certain gifts, certain talents, certain abilities. Maximize them and do it from the perspective that this is a form of. Gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's also a form of ihsan because you know Allah is watching you, He's aware of you, and He knows what your abilities are. You don't know where your limits are, so therefore you should try your best to try and maximize them, right? I look here's here's a thought experiment. Imagine someone gave you, I don't know, gave you like a, a gift, and you know, you're opening the box in front of him, and the gift has to be has to be used. Say you're, I don't know, ha, ha, what, what, should, what kind of gift can we think about here? Something that has to be used to to its best, to the best of its ability. Um, I don't know. I can't think of something. A but knife. say it's a gift. Well, I wouldn't go there, especially in the Muslim context online, talk about knives. <laughs> but yeah, I get you. Okay, actually, that's a good example. Say it's a knife. Yeah, bro. a knife. Cutting, you know, fruit, a knife, cutting meat. A knife. A knife and, and that shows where my mind is, right? <laughs> Stuff, but I'm only kidding. <laughs> So they, they, <laughs> I'm only kidding. So it said more about me than anyone else. No, um, I'm just trying to be cautious. Uh, yeah, say we want to cut, for example, meat, right? This kurbani, kurbani time is coming, right? We want to cut the meat. Ah, actually, that's perfect because that hadith about ihs ihsan is about slaughtering the animal as well. Beautiful, bro. That's a beautiful, Allahu Akbar. Allah. Amazing. So, uh, so someone buys you a knife for kurbani, yeah? And he gives you the knife and he gives you the knife to, sh you know, the sh knife sharpener as well. And he's watching you, right? And you open the box, open the knife, open the knife sharpener. You throw the sharpeners away. You turn the knife the other way, the blunt side, and you start trying to sacrifice the animal. Is that using the knife to the best of its ability? No. Is it a form of gratitude towards the person who gave you the gift? No. Same with your own capacities as a human being, especially in the context of fighting, martial arts, training, whatever. Allah has given you this gift. Don't throw the gift away. And he's always, he's always aware of what you're doing. Don't throw the gift away. And don't misuse the gift, just like in the knife scenario where you're just turning on the blunt side. Mm -hmm. That's the point. So when you go into the gym, if you have that mindset, that could be a form of ibadah. It could be a form of worship. Because you're saying to Allah, Allah, I want to glorify you through the gifts that you've given me. And I know you're aware that you've given me these gifts. And I'm going to miss, I'm going to use them to the best of my ability for a great objective, which is for me to be a strong Muslim 
And being a strong Muslim is pleasing to you because it helps me to do more ibadah, more worship. It helps me to protect my family, to protect those in need, to protect the oppressed, to show a sense of confidence, positive confidence, and so on and so forth. So all of this could be an act of worship. So if you have the right mindset, and what I know I've, I've basically maybe complicated a little bit, but if you have the right mindset, every single training session would be phenomenal. It would be better than, 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 than training in front of like 100,000 people or doing sports in front of 100,000 people. Because uh, you, you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always watching and he's giving you these gifts. You want to maximize the gift to the best of its ability and you want to use them properly. And you want to do all of that for a greater objective, which is, you, oh Allah, you love a strong Muslim. You love a healthy Muslim because it helps with ibadah. It helps with confidence. It helps with, you know, the youth. You know, let's, let's just be real. If when a scholar comes and he looks like, you know, he looks hench and he looks strong. When the youth look at him, they're like, damn, this guy is like, you know, I can relate to this guy. Right. Let's be honest. But if on the other hand, they're looking at a sheikh who's had way too many kebabs, you know, whatever the case may be, he looks like he's not taking this side of his life seriously. By the way, I'm saying this is generalities. We can't point fingers because everyone has the social, biological context. A lot of things are genetic, whatever the case may be. So I'll put that caveat aside. But let's be honest, you know, I've had dinners with some of these people and, you know, their lifestyle is not great in terms of, you know, that's too much food, man, or there's not enough training or whatever. So the point here is, you know, when a youth sees someone like that, they're like, you know, this is someone I could look, look up to. You know, he's taking his... Uh, spiritual and physical uh, gifts seriously you know uh, obviously not everyone has to look like you know i don't know hench or big or strong but someone who has a sense of confidence and it's not always about the size it's not always about um it's about the energy that comes out because remember i don't want people to conflate that you have to be big and muscly no it because when you are involved in taking care of yourself spiritually and physically there is a what you call a, a robe a sense of an aura around you that is a little bit different from people who don't take those aspects of their life seriously as well. It's not because remember, I believe Ali or An had a bit of a pop belly. Obviously, that's totally different from being obese or, or out of, or, or overweight for sure. But it's not necessarily how you look. It's about, you know, are you taking and prioritizing these things in, in a way that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And other people may not even have the time, to be honest. They may be busy in ilm and, in, in, and stuff like that, um, which is far more important than going to the gym for sure. However, just as a general point, is if you're going to engage in this stuff, it can be a great act of worship um, based on what I've just said. So, yeah. Yeah, not to get too uh, Christian-y, but a perfect example is like, if someone wanted to get the spiritual aspect of it, uh, since Allah is always watching, it's almost kind of like the equivalent of like uh, the father watching his son and the son wanting to make his father proud. And obviously, like I said, I'm not getting Christian here because then, you know, a lot of people are like, ah, see, that's Jesus. But no, nah, no, nah, yeah, you, I, I, you I probably that. understand what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. So look, as I said, in, I think in the previous podcast with the, with, and with Allah is the greatest example, Laysa um, And this is not an analogy, of course, you're just saying by greater reason. Yeah. So, uh, but obviously, when we do talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we, we, even when we use such examples, we should refrain away from the kind of fun father son scenario. But I get the underlying mm. concept of what you're saying. Absolutely. Mm. So, you know, Allah is your creator and you want to please your creator. He created you. So, you want to please him, right? Um, and he's giving you certain gifts and you like fitness. It's your thing. You like martial arts. So you want to basically maximize the gifts he's given you and use them in the right way. And in line with the great objective, which is you, you oh Allah, you love a strong Muslim. Uh, and I'm doing this to, to have the right energy for your sake, to inspire people, to show that Islam has a good way of life and that we are confident people. And, and, and also because I want to be able to, you know, show that I can protect my family and so on and so forth, right? Which is very important, right? Especially in the age of Islamophobia, um, because, you know, we have no choice but to look confident. Obviously, we should never seek uh, any kind of um, tribulation or any kind of a, a aggressive scenarios, not at all, you know, we're peaceful people. But, you know, if, if we, we, we have to be in a certain spiritual and physical state where if something were to happen, just by the way that we look, it will be a barrier for people to, uh, you know, try and try and do something. Uh, 
And that's why, you know, um, it's important. You know, you heard really silly stories about, you know, people's wives being attacked or being, you know, that sh should be totally unacceptable and that should never, ever happen um, to anyone, not just Muslims, but non-Muslims as well. But, you know, specifically, you know, in the Islamic tradition, where we honor our women, and we, we are the protectors of our women. You know, we, we have to be able to do that in a confident way. And, you know, uh, that's an act of worship too, doing it so you, you, you are able to stand your ground if necessary, right? Um, yeah, so just to repeat, use the gifts Allah has given you to the best of your ability. Don't misuse them um, and try and maximize them as best as possible. It's a form of gratitude, but also do it with the great objective in mind, which is it's an act of worship because, oh Allah, I know you like a strong, a strong person, someone who takes care of themselves, um, and I'm doing it for your sake in order to create a positive image about what it means to be a Muslim man, for example, right? Or what it means to be, uh, oh, sorry, and what it means to be a, a, a good human being, that, you know, you are strong and you're taking care of yourself and, and you have, a, and it helps with your sense of bravery. We spoke about this last time. The Prophet was the most brave and that's a very key aspect of leadership. And let's be honest, Bravery is a psychological thing, but, but also the physical aspect helps. It helps with that bravery, bravery, right? So if you're confident about yourself and your physical abilities and your strengths and so on and so forth, uh, that helps with bravery. And bravery is one of the missing pillars of Islamic leadership at the moment, right? Um, so bravery is important. Um, so all of these things. So yeah, so have that ihsan in your training and link it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you have to also be very careful. And this is important for people listening. It's so easy to get involved in the whole ego thing, right? You know, bodybuilding, having that six pack, looking good. Now, is that really for the sake of Allah? I don't know, man. I don't know. Maybe if your wife likes it, then it's for the sake of Allah, because you know, you know, it's an act of worship. If your what wife wife wants something about you to look in a certain way, then you should do it, right? Uh, and likewise, the other way around. Um, but you know, usually when people put things on Instagram and stuff like that, and they're bodybuilders. I just find it a bit difficult to appreciate that that is uh, purely mm. uh, within the Islamic ethics of things. Yeah, um, it should be functional. Yeah, it, should be, it, sh it should be a for particular purpose. And I would even say bodybuilding itself is is not a great sport anyway. Um, to do weightlifting is good. To be strong, even maybe to have some size, because there is a correlation between weight and your ability to to punch. Mm. It's not a direct correlation because you have middleweights who could punch like heavyweights, right? Because of the technique. But there is, that's why you have weight classes, right? So weight is important as well if you're going to gain some muscle mass for sure. But just to do it, just to like make sure your bicep is in like, you know, perfect dimensions with your tricep and, you know, the, the mm -hmm. sides of your pecs are coming out and off. And mm -hmm. yeah, and if you're doing that for your wife, no problem. But if you're doing it just for the sake of vanity, then I find bodybuilding a very kind of... Uh, spiritually immature sport <laughs> what if, what if, what if is, your wife is your wife's too. chilling with you and she's like babe i like the 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 dad bod the beer belly well I'm stuck for a little not the beer belly but the belly you know i yeah. like that you know i find that cute what would you say then yeah well that's a good question well, well i would say you should have asked her that before you got married <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i don't know that well you know yanni you if she, if she doesn't like a six pack, then don't have six pack. You could still be fit and not have a six pack. No problem. I mean, mm. she's your wife, man. Hey, you know, this is more food. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, uh, it, it, you know, we have to be careful of this because sometimes we always expect our sisters to look in a certain way. But when you look at the brothers, like, what the flip, man? What's wrong with you? I mean, oh, yeah. you know, you want, you want, you want like a, a sister like who's just like Khadija radiallahu anha, and she looks like a hoodie from Jannah. But you, you look like, you know, as if you just crawled out of, crawled out of Jahannam, man. Some of us, right? You look, like, but, you know, this is, this is a form of arrogance. And you know what we said about what it means to be a man in the previous uh, pod, the podcast? We spoke about it. it's all these psychological and, uh, things and concerning ego and forbearance. And it's very egotistical to always expect from our sisters. And then, but, and then when you look at the brother, you're like, come on, man. You need to fix up too. You need to, you need to play your part. You know, your wife has rights, you know. Yeah. The, the same right as you have you know the sense of physical pleasure and so on and so, on and so forth your wife has that too and your wife might not even say it. you know why because our sisters have haya, right they, they may not say it and they may be suffering because and you just you don't have that awareness because you, you got you, you lack manliness right because a true man wants to please his wife 
on from that perspective. That's what a true man is. It's not a one-way relationship, right? I find it so unmanly, unhuman, man, unethical to like gain from someone and not give anything back. We should want to give back more than we received. That's that's what a real man is, to give back more than you received, right? And once you do that, you would enjoy the giving more than the receiving. By the way, I'm not only talking about this in, in the context of uh, marriage. This is in life in general as well. Um, but anyway, yeah, so fitness is important. So what, 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 what fitness do you guys do? MMA. Allah Akbar. Yes. Allah Akbar. No, but your, I was about to say uh, before, because I, I, we wanted to ask you about uh, more so the Wing Chun. I wanted to know mm. more about that. But um, what you said about bodybuilding hits home. And I've spoken to Rami about this, but um, right now I weigh 154 pounds, which okay. is pretty, it's pretty light. I'm not going to lie to you. It's pretty light. When I was doing bodybuilding before Islam, I was closing in on like 200 pounds. Wow. And I was, I was diesel. Like I had so much weight on me that my knees would hurt just from walking around. <laughs> And I remember when I got I got into uh into MMA a little bit and it was actually the Muay Thai aspect and my friend was trying to show me something he was trying to show me the footwork he's like bro you're so heavy like you need to lose weight and I remember like at 190 I just I could barely move around whereas I was just super heavy with my footwork and then the moment that I like dropped down to like 154 I'm like flying across the mat bro yeah yeah so there is there is a sweet spot but everyone has the different sweet spot like i re i remember going down to like 82 kilos i think my body weight was like six percent body fat or something hey, that's it was much. i i just didn't i mean i just didn't i wasn't comfortable it was too too low too low although that was my ideal weight i think Really? For like from a, from a medical perspective, yeah, but I just felt too low, eighty-two kilos, no weight. I just and I looked really bad. I looked like, you know, my love protect us like a, like a cancer victim or something. Man, it was terrible. I was very fast, but you know, if someone charged at me, I would have <laughs> I would have collapsed or something. Yeah. So everyone has their own 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 thing, their own range, oh. and yeah? you just have to yeah. find what that is. Uh, like if I was one fifty-five, I'll probably be dead. I'll probably be dead now. How much you weigh right now? My weight is um, I'm 105 kilos, I think. So I'm about 230 pounds, I think, or 220 pounds at the moment. How tall are you? Uh, I think I'm five five eleven. I think or five ten and a half, five eleven. Yeah. So that's uh, big. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was so, about to say. So, like... so, I, so I'm in the stage of uh, strength training at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I've gone like you know a bit bigger, um, but my my view is to turn it around and just basically cut down and just to find that sweet spot again. Um, because I needed that sense of strength. So like I'm nearly 41. So I'm going to be 41 in September. And at this age, you need to start focusing on the muscle because your muscle would go down eventually. Now you could keep a very good uh, size and strength, even up to age of 60. Like, you know, people that I train with, you know, they're like what mid fifties or something nearly and they're, well, I used to train with them and they're very, very strong, but you just have to be consistent. So uh, that's important. Uh, and it's also, it's a sense of, it's, for me, a lot of it is psychological as well. You, if I don't train, like I don't feel right. You need those endorphins or, you know, everyone's wired differently. And you need that sense of growth, that sense of, you know, physical expression. Uh, some people need it. Some people don't. I need it. I have to be, I have to train. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to keep this weight. Although I feel okay. I could sprint and stuff, but I'm just borderline. If I go too much, then it's game over. <laughs> so I need to bring it back down, which I'm going to aim to do. But at the moment, I'm just enjoying the, the strength aspect, um, you know, and hopefully it's functional strength as well. So that's very important. And that's why for, good, Muslims, yeah. you know, for Muslims, we should do things with purpose, like, you know, be functional. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Oh, oh. So in terms of your MMA, what's your kind of style? Are you a ground guy? Are you stand up? Are you both? I mean, my body tends to lean towards striking, but I have to work the ground game. You know how it is. Yeah. 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 Well, what um, you could do is you could train your ground game to the level 
where you could basically neutralize any kind of takedowns or neutralize yeah. anything. Yeah. You don't have to be a master on the ground. So my advice would be is master one thing. Like I would always be scared of someone who has, who has mastered, for example, the left, right. And he's done it for about 10,000 hours rather than someone who's a little bit good at everything. Because mm-hmm. when someone's sharpened one tool really, really well, then that person is very dangerous. Like, like McGregor, take McGregor, for example, right? Notwithstanding his personality issues, right? But that, <laughs> but that, that left hand, right? Mm-hmm. That is, that's a bomb, right? If he catches you with that, it could be good night. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're the best grappler. If he catches you, you're, you're finished, right? And that's why people would, man- would, would basically create a strategy in order to prevent facing that left hand. Um, likewise, you know, if someone's a really good wrestler, you have to create a strategy that you could basically neutralize some of his takedowns or neutralize some of his attacks or his groundwork in order for you to basically give you the opportunity to focus on the strengths that you have, which is your, your, your striking game. But nevertheless, you have to have both though, because, you know, if you don't know how to deal with the groundwork, it's finished. <laughs> you're, you're literally finished. Yeah, yeah 100%. So, but yeah, so yeah, I mean, it's good. What about you guys? Anything you guys do in terms of fitness, Fayad? Rami? Yeah, I used to be more into like strength training and all that. I do more calisthenics now. Oh wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That that's good. I'm just those to... those guys. And you know, you know, you know the thing with, 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 with that type of training and even strength training, even if you don't have any like kind of martial skills, because you're going to be in the top 10, 15% of your age group or your or, or your or your kind of uh, group of people, strength to a certain degree would outweigh skill. Mm. And even fitness, like for example, if you do calisthenics to the degree that you're really, really fit and you do high intensity training, if you're able to be far more fitter and run around someone who's quite skillful, the fitter guy can win. Like for example, if you have uh, two skilled guys that are the same, but one is fitter, the fitter guy would always win. But I would also argue if you have two skilled guys and one guy has less skills, but he's fitter, the fitter guy may win. Mm. yeah so and you see that a lot you know because you may have the greatest skills but if you can't last more than a half, one and a half minutes in the ring then Facts. what's the point yeah 100%, the point? Man. i used to so i used to wait i used to wait 240 about two years ago and oh. like completely like bulked up you know strong deadlifting benching but it's like bro it's time for salah i'm huffing and puffing now i'm like 175 and it's like i feel light on my feet playing with little kids and stuff i don't really feel tired right so yeah, 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 yeah. I prefer so, yeah. this a little more, and and I could see how myself, I like in you know, as a father, or like later in my life, this type of body type would be way better than like just lifting heavy stuff. Yeah, yeah for sure, mm-hmm. absolutely. And plus, you could be strong without gaining size anyway. You just have to basically change your training. Like if you look at the Olympic weightlifters, some of them look quite slim, but they're mm-hmm. very powerful and they're very yeah. strong. Yeah, and that's why in MMA and even in boxing, you incorporate the powerlifting aspects as well. So, you know, the, the snatch and, and so on and so forth, um, and even deadlifts. Um, yeah, so if you keep, you could keep the, 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 the key components of the weight training, but you could incorporate in a functional uh, fitness. I mean, my advice is not to do deadlifts. My advice would be to do the, what's that bar thing that goes around you? Trap the bar. T-bar. The oh, what yeah, bar? The trap bar. The trap bar, yeah. The reason it's very good because you're less likely to damage your lower back. Oh, yeah. And just for longe- and for longevity, you want to think about 10, 15, 20, 30 years in the future if you want to keep on training and you should. You know, you should use exercises that are less likely to just grind you and, and mess you up. So you can get the same benefits with the trap bar. Maybe not 100% the same. You use a little bit more legs, but you still get your lower back and your glutes and stuff and you get that core strength uh, and that, you know, you get that power from the trap bar. So I would advise everyone to even invest in the trap bar because deadlifts could, they could, they could destroy you, man. <laughs> they could destroy oh, you. I, I can speak from experience. You know, the uh, stiff-legged deadlifts? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Like, like Romanian? <clears throat> Is that what it's called? Like, Roman, like, you, it's like you're just going down like this. Yeah, it's for hamstrings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Good, good mor- it's called good morning exercise, right? Oh no, the good morning is when you have it on your back and you're mm-hmm. doing that same thing. But um, I was oh, doing okay. the stiff legged deadlift in 2017, and I remember like I, I was lifting this weight way too heavy for no reason. <laughs> and um, as I'm lifting it, I felt this like kind of like pool in my back i was like ah like what is this so i started stretching it and then i went right back to doing the exercise 
And then like it just kept getting tighter. I was like, yo, what's going on? And then my uh my my dumb self went over to the leg press. It was like, all right, well, my back is tight. Let's hit some leg press then. And then I started going in on that the leg press. And then by the end of the workout, I was just stuck like this. I couldn't even get up. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, something happened. And to this day, I still feel it in my lower back if I'm not careful. So mm. it, you, no, speak yeah, you speak yeah, truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you need to think about longevity. You think about um, all of those things. is very important because, you know, having a short-term mindset on these issues, it could really, really, really damage you, like really damage you. Uh, I remember my elbows were on fire when I was trying to do, I think I was doing boxing training and I was like doing like uh, weight training as well literally you, my elbows were on fire like the tendonitis i had was just crazy and i'm the kind of guy that would train around it <laughs> like rest the sun psychological about not training I'll, I'll be i'll be like oh no no it's fine i'll try and train around it it would just make it worse and that's because it's all a sense of overtraining or, or not not being wise so you need to use the right exercises for for your longevity you know uh what about rami what do you do do you do you, do you, do you play basketball or do you what do you do <laughs> oh he knew it bro yeah, yeah i used to play basketball a lot growing up alhamdulillah more oh really yeah, a lot, alhamdulillah um more recently i've been just trying to put on weight um weightlifting all that the gym's closed so i switched like calisthenics and stuff at home um but yeah, yeah that's really good you know like when the gym's closed as well i had bands and band training is actually really good so you could get this not exactly the same in my experience but you could get similar growth and similar strength if you train with bands but to uh to failure what i mean by bands is like the proper heavy duty bands yeah mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah and you know you could do back you could do uh chest you could do uh, um, legs you could do everything and it, mm -hmm. you get the pump you get a better pump as well i believe right yeah. so uh yeah band helped me just maintain um, so you know you should never have an excuse and that's why I always say discipline is more important than motivation I know a lot of people say this as well because motivation will go up and down but if you have a vision for yourself and then you, you set a plan of action you're disciplined with that you, you're more likely to be successful because discipline trumps um, motivation any day and you know you're just pulling yourself out of bed and just doing it and that's why even with fajr right when people have difficulty praying fajr it's just about being disciplined. It's just getting yourself up, right? And just doing it, right? Um, discipline is extremely important for most things in life, to be honest. And discipline is linked to sabr. And I think it was Ibn Qayyum, you know, may Allah mention him, he said, I think the basis for all of akhlaq or adab is sabr, right? You know, and that's why patience is so important because that is one of the necessary aspects of you to be disciplined. You need to be patient. Because discipline is actually working hard over a long period of time in order to reach your goal and your vision. And there's going to be, I remember I, I had to train twice. Uh, I was doing this camp and had to train twice a day sometimes. And, you know, you train in the morning and you got to pull yourself out in the evening. And what you're, I'm talking about, you know, you, you work the whole day and you've got family and then you still got to basically go and train in the evening. It's a nightmare. Or even train on your own, right? Um, so discipline is always going to make you uh, reach your goals. And that's why I think to everyone listening, I know we've been talking about we, uh, our conversation. Our conversation has been a bit more relaxed, but um, what people need to have a vision for themselves. You know, what does a vision mean? It basically means where do I want to see myself? Right. So where do I want to see myself in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? So what do you look like? Now, your vision can change over time as you mature, no problem, but you should have a vision. Where, because some, and the, but the thing about people your age or even, even my age still, people don't have a vision for themselves. So you should have a vision about, you know, obviously we all want to go paradise for sure, yeah? We want to be good Muslims, but that's too generic. You know, have a vision. What, what do you want to look like physically, spiritually, intellectually, and socially in the next 10 years? Write it down. Once you have a vision for yourself, then choose at least three or five or a certain limited actions or strategies that you're going to adopt that are, that are necessarily linked to your vision. Meaning if you do them, you're more likely to achieve your vision. 
brainstorm that, look at successful people, do shura, speak to people around you, speak to scholars, whatever. How do I get this done? And then after, have daily actions that are linked to those strategies, right? I'll give you an example. If someone wants to be a person of dhikr, right? You want to be the person that does the morning and, and evening dhikr every day. But you want to do it in a way that is the dhikr of the tongue and the heart. You know, in and now we, what does he talk about in I think in Kitab al-Athqar when he talks about you know the different types of dhikr. Yes, you could just utter it and not know the meaning, you still get reward, but you get more reward, right? Or it has more impact if you're doing the dhikr and you're saying it relatively slowly and you know the meaning and your heart is attached to what you're saying. Like in Dhul Hijjah, for example. You know, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that, you know, it's, it's, it's the best dhikr to do is La ilaha illallah, right? Is to do the um, Alhamdulillah, is to do uh, the takbir, right? So th- these things are very important. So, um, uh, and, and if you were to do that and know the meaning of, for example, La ilaha illallah, to know the meaning of Alhamdulillah, to know the meaning of Subhanallah, to know the meaning of of um, uh, Allah. Allahu Akbar, yeah. So, uh, you, if your heart is attached to when you're seeing it and you're, you're present with it, it's going to have a great impact. Right? Everything has a polish, and the polish of the of the heart is the dhikr of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So, uh, the point is, so say you want to be a person of morning dhikr of morning iman. You want you want that consistent. I want to be a person of dhikr, and so that means you have to do your evening and your morning dhikr and your duas. So the way to do that is to say, right, in, and say this is a small vision. I want to be able to do this consistently in the next three months. So in three months, I see myself as someone who is a person of dhikr, always consistently doing the morning and evening of God. So now you've got to think about certain actions that you need to do daily in order for that to happen. Well, some of the actions include, well, first and foremost, memorize your dhikr or if you can't do that, it's a bit of a jump. Just select the afkar that are more closer to what you, what you, what you align yourself with. Collect the du'as that the the initial du'as that you maybe appreciate more. So say it's three dhikr. Say it's Subhanallah with hamdihi a hundred times in the in the morning. Say it's La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu lahu almulku wa lahu alhamdu wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Say it's ten times in the morning and the evening. And then you pick something else. And then you, you keep those three. Then you have, right, you, you pick these two du'as, right? Say you say, Bismillahi, which, Uraditu bilahi rabban wabi islami deenan wabi muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Okay? Uh, I'm content with, with uh, Allah's, the deen, the deen is my religion, with Allah is my Lord, and the, the Prophet is my, is my Prophet. You say that three times in the morning and evening. Um, and that has its benefits as well. So um, you pick two du'as and three afghar, and then you, you, you start doing them. So you do that for the first week. The next phase would be, right, let me learn the meanings of the individual words of these afghar and these du'as. So then you learn the meaning. And then you say them with the meaning in mind. And you do it with a sense of presence, right? So when you've done that, then you try and memorize them. And then you will, because after a few days or weeks, you'll memorize them very easily. Then that's part of your routine now, morning and evening. And then you put you create an environment that facilitates your vision in the context of dhikr. So maybe you'd have your dhikr book always next to you before you go to bed. So it's, it's part of your environment. Or you have it on your office table. You have different copies in different places. So it's always reminding you. It's part of your environment to, to remind you. Or you put reminders on your phone. So you create an environment for yourself to in order for you to do the dhikr and the du'as. Once you've done that, then you could add now the other afghar to do right? Then you could add more du'as to do. When you reach to a certain level where now you're trying to fulfill the complete sunnah of the morning and the evening, and you could do that over the next few weeks and months, and then by the third month, you've got it all under your belt now, and you and it's all about being consistent. And obviously, while you're doing that, you praise Allah, and you thank Allah, and you make du'a to Allah to make it easy for you to do this, because it's only going to happen because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, I know this is a very small example, but Everyone should have a vision for themselves and and that should include spiritual, physical, social, and otherwise. And that should always be, you should always remind yourself about where you want to go, where what you want to be, or, or, or what does Hamza look like in the next 10 to 15 years? And then you got to create a strategy or a set of strategies in order 
for that vision to materialize, which would which would affect your daily actions every day. So when it comes to you, brothers, or anything, when it comes to fitness, spirituality and stuff, just have a vision for yourself. And that vision may change over time. There's nothing wrong with that. But have a vision and then have a strategy to make that vision happen and then link daily actions that are part of that strategy for that vision to materialize. I don't know how we got to this. I think it's important. I mean, it is the <laughs> bad now, alhamdulillah. With that being yeah. said, what is your current personal routine right now? I'm going to be very honest with you. Uh, and hopefully I've tried to be authentic in these podcasts. Yeah. It's, you know, authenticity is one of the missing things in social media. Yeah, Is that guy real? That guy is not real. Does he always speak like that? Like, you know, I, I mm. know sometimes when you see people, obviously you must have an other, right? You know, the famous statement of Sufyan al Thawri when he said, you know, I'm not like I am with my buddies kind of thing with the Ummah because they'll just think that, you know, Islam, they won't take Islam seriously. So I do agree. But in the age of social media, there is a certain context where we need to revive a sense of authenticity because when someone's authentic, there's something loving about that person. There's something like, you know, I, I want to know more about them. I want to take them more seriously because they're coming mm. across as genuine and authentic. Yeah. It's not just a drama or a show. Yeah. So to be very authentic with you, and hopefully I won't regret this, yeah. Um, I've been absolutely lacking in the, for the past few weeks, maybe yeah, a few weeks. I need to mm-hmm. get back. On, I need life, to get bro. back. I need to get back on track when it comes to routine. But I know what I need to do. That's the thing. Mm-hmm. So the good thing about having this discipline and vision, I know what needs to happen, and I just need to recalibrate and decompress. So it, it was it was a crazy period, especially in Ramadan. Um, because of, you know, getting a new project like Sapiens and making sure we had to be in a certain position and get work done and trying to manage everybody and trying to create, you know, essentially create a new organization. Uh, that is, that basically absorbed, actually, that's just an excuse, forget that, man. That's just an excuse. Mm. Well, lie is an excuse. Yeah, I'm just, so I'm just listening to, I'm just yeah, listening no, to myself. No, no. What, kind of so, a, what kind of subtle excuse is this? Actually, uh-huh. excuse. I've literally failed for the past few weeks, bro, and I'm going to sort myself out. Thank you for Inshallah, reminding man. me. There you, go, <laughs> there you, hey, you reminded yeah, yourself. You reminded yourself. I need to. I need to. Uh, I need to uh, get back on track in terms of like the morning routine. So the mm-hmm. ideal morning routine would be, you know, wake up in the morning, obviously pray your fajr. Ideally, must be in the masjid. You should do in the masjid, doing your dhikr in the morning going to the gym, I think morning workouts are something different. Like you've, you've achieved something, especially if it's a tough one and you've got the whole day in front of you. So that's very important. Obviously, your whole day should be revolved around salah. Obviously, with the work that we do, that's relatively easy because we don't have other kind of things that, you know, other things that's going to affect that. Um, um, and then after, you have to do your daily actions that link to your vision. So for example, you know, at the moment, I have to finish a dissertation that is going to um, have to give in on the 1st of September. So my daily actions will be, I have to at least write maybe 800 words a day, but 800 good words, researched words a day, for example. Yeah. So that would be part of my uh, daily practice um, in terms of just work wise or acad- academia wise. Uh, then you have other things that, for example, you know, if you're in a leadership position, then true leadership, in my view, is leading from the front and leading from the behind and also empowering and developing your people. So you should be committed to the well being of your people. So you need to make sure that you have a plan, uh, your own plan of action for the people that you're supposed to be managing to get the best out of them and to create, get the best version of them, right? Because a lot of people, you'd be so surprised what a little bit of encouragement does to a human being. Wallahi. Uh, and people sometimes need that. Even if they're already successful, you could unveil blind spots in them in order to see things that you see, get, get them to see things that you see. And like, yes, I can achieve this because the whole art of that type of leadership is to see in people what they can't see in themselves and get them to see that and get them to move forward and realize that, you know? So, you know, part of your daily actions were to be to help your people. Obviously, you have your family daily actions as well, what you need to do with the children and so on and so forth, because you, you'll have visions for your children as well, right? And then you'd have to do daily actions that link to, their, to, to the vision that you have for your children, that you want your children to be pious, you want them to be, you know, able to deal with life's problems in the most effective way and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, at the moment, it's a bit of a transitionary period. I'm going to, inshallah, fix up. But yeah, there's me being vulnerable. <laughs> yeah, so, when you're, when you're, so when your vision. 
Are we yeah. just, we're gonna go both same time? Don't say that no, again, no, no. Both at the same right, time. Same let's time. Go. All right, let's go. All right. Nah, I'll go first, bro. Uh, so you would say that your vision is that in the next five to ten years, you see Hamza Diesel for his wife, for the sake of Allah, of course, and just putting in work and being able to spread the dawah even more. Yeah, so that's actually a good question. I think I'm in a stage in my life at the moment that I need to review my vision, uh, but uh, that should happen very soon. And I think what it's going to involve in, it, what it's going to involve is obviously a vision for the dawah, but not maybe myself necessarily, but for the people that I'm trying to help manage and develop in order for them to become better versions of themselves and for them to help and manage and develop other people because true leadership is creating other leaders right in in, in a certain sense especially in the context of the dawa because this whole kind of celebrity kind of dawa is not, not not the most effective right we need to basically create other leaders and leadership doesn't mean always being on social media always being very loud or always being you know um, you know, in, in the public limelight, leadership has different dimensions. So creating leaders in order to create effective change for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is definitely going to involve something like that. Um, obviously, from a personal point of view, definitely reviving uh, the Quran as a central focus in my life, especially from the point of view of tadabbur and meaning and understanding the Quran and, and taking that journey a little bit more seriously, much more seriously. Um because, you know, you get to realize after all of this philosophy and all of this stuff, then you always come back to the Qur'an. The Qur'an's arguments are the best arguments. The Qur'an's narratives are the best narratives. The Qur'an's values are the best values. They come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So being connected to the Qur'an and, and actually sharing that message with others and, and, and all your work being contingent on the Qur'an in terms of referring to it contis- con- consistently in a way that people can understand, that, that definitely is going to be a personal vision of, of mine as well, inshallah. But also because I'm a father, um, uh, uh, stay with me. I'm just going to put the charger in, yeah? One second. Mm-hmm. One second, one second. Because I'm using my phone. One second. So the way to charge this is to basically uh, put it onto the laptop. Yeah, so, um, the you know, I really have to um, start thinking more now seriously about the vision for the family as a whole as well. Obviously, that was already there to a certain degree. But now, you know, as I said, your vision changes as you develop and it can change and you'd have to adapt. So more at this age now, more thinking about the kids and, you know, how can, how can we get the best out of them? How can we make them into like the ideal Muslim? Um, and also mm. for them to be able to learn from the mistakes in a way that makes them grow. And for them to be able to basically have that kind of sense of self-mastery, you know, uh, from an Islamic perspective, that's very important. So that's going to be something that I'm going to be focusing on as well. Um, and yeah, so there's all this academic vision, there's a physical vision, there's a relationships vision. There's, you know, I've learned recently, maybe in the past four or five years, maybe that, you know, to love someone, for example, you should love them the way they want to be loved, not the way you want to be loved. Yeah, and that, you know, sometimes relationships fails because, you know, say, for example, your love language is gifts and words of affirmation. Yeah. Just echoing the book, The Five Love Languages, yeah, which is actually a quite good book. Uh, and, you're, and you like that. So you like gifts. You think that's an expression of love. And you also like um, uh, words of affirmation. I love you, right? Now, say your spouse their love language is not gifts and their love language is not words of affirmation. If you're basically going to start giving them gifts all the time and words of affirmation, they're never going to feel love. Their love tank is not going to be filled. You think you've been so loving, but really you just like loving yourself, man, in, in maybe, maybe a narcissistic way because true love is loving someone the way they want to be loved. So, you know, maybe to f- focus on that much more now as well. Obviously, hopefully I, I had it, but you know, just to realize that with everybody around, not just your spouse and your children, but everyone around, you know, what makes this person feel loved, you know, because the person's son was, was someone who was uh, a rahmah to, to ev- the whole world. And the way he related to people, they felt that they were like the center of his universe or the most loved, right? We know the famous uh, narrations. Um, so, you know, find out what 
how people how, how can you make someone feel loved right and you know maybe Fayyad's uh, love language is um, gifts or maybe it's words of affirmation so when I connect with him I'm going to connect with him in that way so his love tank is filled right but, you know he, he'll feel complete you know when, we, when, when we're relating to each other other people they don't they just like a bit of uh, they're more like touch they like touch so a pat on the back or a hug or, um, other people might like um, quality time just spending time with someone right uh, everyone's different everyone's got mm. their own love languages so anyway, I don't know how I got into that but yeah so uh, where do I see myself I, I'm, I'm in the stage of redeveloping that vision I think now yeah. so let me just turn the p- question back to you guys so where do you see yourself let's start with the question of first Habib so where do you see yourself in 10 years I, I, can, tough, I can barely see myself in a few months from now. I can't, I can't even see in a few days, bro. Yeah. Wow. Okay, maybe, maybe let's change the question. Hmm. If you man- were managing yourself, say someone hmm. came into the room and it happened to be you. So you are outside of yourself, but you're managing yourself. And then that's your sole responsibility. And then that person says, right, I want to be the best version of myself in 10 years. What does that look like? So you need to manage them. You need to take them there. How are you going to take you there? Uh, okay, I got I got a few things. I got a few things. Mm-hmm. Good, good. Uh, bismillah, bismillah. So in terms of physical, I want to at least be in peak performance, you know, and I'm not just saying like, oh, in the gym, uh, in fighting. I'm talking about like in everything that I'm doing so like if I gotta if I gotta help someone move I can help them move without breaking a sweat if I'm gotta walk like 10 15 20 miles I can walk 10 15 20 miles without any issue you know no medical issues no nothing not taking any medication just on that good whole food provided by okay okay the so, creator okay so that's that so how are you gonna get that what do you think are the three main key actions to get to that uh, continuing training, continuing eating properly, and continue to do new training programs to, you know, keep progressing. Okay, so what would be what would a week look like now? Exactly what I'm doing right now. Well, I'm training like That's anywhere good. from. Okay, brilliant. And then, yeah. so then, then you say, says, what does a day look like? Right. So you break it down like that. So that's the fitness. So give me a spiritual goal now spiritual goal <sighs> <laughs> I want to be able to be more in tune with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because sometimes I have high iman sometimes I have low iman and when I have low iman I'm being honest it's it can be very difficult um, I have ADHD, so that's uh, it, it makes my mental state be all over the place. Whereas, like you know how you were saying, you have to train in order for you to like feel feel good. I have to train too. If I don't train mentally, I feel like I'm just off, like I'm in a haze, you know. So I, I just I want to be able to have that real focus and that real like really be in tune. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, I so... That's, that's my goal. Yeah, so you want to aim to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so what do you think... What are the three main things you need to do to achieve that? Zikr. Okay, good. So uh, you be a person of zikr. So you start learning your morning and evening of God and you be, com- mm-hmm. you be consistent. Um, Quran, right? Yeah, that could be a day. Read Quran every day, these every 20 minutes. Yeah. Every 20, after Fajr, just read it 20 minutes. Even if you can't read the Arabic, read the English, ponder on the meanings. Um, also, obviously, we know about the Fara'id, the five daily prayers, etc. Um, but, you know, have subrogatory actions as well, because the whole concept, and obviously this is advice to myself, the whole concept of the Fard is like a, it's like a fortress around the heart, protecting the heart, right? 
and then the sunnah is like a, a double another fortress and then the extra actions is like another fortress protecting the heart so when you remove some of the supergatory actions you move away the the sunnah and and then it will just your the fortress is not that strong right from a kind of heart perspective so think about daily practice something that you should do every day that only you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows right and that would preserve the ikhlas aspect and it could be giving sadaqah every day even if it's like a dollar right or it could be you know doing an extra prayer like the um uh, the 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 for the the prayer before the noon right um which was a very consistent prayer of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or you know get up 10 minutes before fajr time once a week make that dua you know in the last third of the night and, and just cry to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and beg him to keep you strong and increase your iman um and also try and throw in two rakats as well as a tahajjud prayer you know or, or qiyam al-layl um, so try and find some things that also your heart is more inclined towards. Like some people are more inclined towards dhikr rather than uh, the extra prayers like tahajjud, for example, or some people are more inclined to this than the other. Obviously, we should try and do everything as much as possible, but see where, 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 where did, what does your heart tell you? Um, but one thing as well is to get your vision spiritually in tune is to have right people around you. Uh, when you speak to the scholars of Taskir to Nafs, you know, the spiritual diseases of the heart, how to deal with them, how to deal with Iman, one of the key things, the key thing is companionship. It is so important. You're, you are the product of the people around you, yeah? And, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially when it comes to youth, the, the people of the cave, they were youth, right? And the, a dog happened to be with them and Allah saved the people of the cave and Allah saved the dog. So you could question, why does Allah save the dog as well? Why is the dog even mentioned? But there's a powerful story here because Allah is basically maybe telling us that if Allah can save a lowly animal like a dog, because it happened to be with pious people, imagine how Allah will save you if you happen to be with pious people. Yeah. So the power of your environment, force yourself in good environments. That is, probably the basis of any spiritual development is to force yourself in good environments so you do the you do your quran you do your extra thing that thing that that you own it could be uh maybe a tahajjud salah it could be the duas in the last third of the night it could be sadaqah it could be a combination but just pick something that you just own and, and keep on being consistent with it it could be uh yeah so uh, but but whatever you choose you have to have good companionship because, you know, even if you do all these great things, uh, unless you're a really, really good leader, it's going to be so difficult for you to stay on track. You have to be around good people. You have to be around good people. Uh, and that's very important for you to have good people around you. Alhamdulillah, you're in, you're, in good, you're in good company here with Fayyad and Rami. Alhamdulillah. So, yeah, so, that, so the exercise we're doing now, obviously, it's not a complete and it's not thorough. But even this kind of conversation gets people to realize I need a vision. I need a vision for my life. I need, I want to be someone who is close to Allah. I want to be someone who's physically fit and healthy. I want to be someone who's a good leader that inspires other people for the sake of Allah, right? How do I get there? What do I do? So talk to people, ask people who already achieved that. It's called bright spotting. Go to the bright stars of the Ummah. Ask them, how do you, how do you, how do you do this? How do you learn to speak like this? How do you learn to lead? How do you learn to be so humble? How do you, whatever. Speak to them. Find out what they do. Do the bright spotting. Have good people around you. Um, think about the essential actions that would lead to your vision. And then break it down on a day-to-day -day basis. All these conversations and these questions need to be raised and you need to, we need to take it very seriously. In actual fact, wallahi, you know, maybe this kind of transitional phase I'm in, just being on this podcast with you has been one of the greatest blessings I can ever imagine. Honestly, if only you knew. If only you knew. It's actually now, it's forcing me now not to, not to sound like a hypocrite and put some of these things in action now, right? Because I'm thinking... What have you been doing for the past few weeks or months? You need to get back on track, man. What's going on, Hamza, right? So this has been such... Wallahi, I could never think enough. I am eternally grateful for this conversation. For even me just like chilling on this chair, just talking to you in a, hopefully the most authentic way. Uh, I, it's, yeah, yeah. May Allah make ease for all of us.
But I think the lesson that everyone should learn and we should learn is let's have a vision for ourselves. Um, I think Ibn Qayyim as well, he said those who are, are suffer from shubuhat, from destructive doubts, um, they don't have a vision for themselves. They are people who don't have vision for themselves. So we need a vision for our lives, right? Otherwise, we're going to get affected by the shubuhat, the destructive doubts, and there's, you know, the tsunami of atheism and liberalism and neo and neo this and neo that and feminism and postmodernism and all of these isms and schisms, these alien, these alien ideological constructs and narratives. They're there to, they're there as shubuhat to try and attach to our hearts and drain our iman. And Ibn Qayyim made a really good point, saying. You don't have a vision for yourself if you're going to get affected like that from that perspective. So we should have vision for ourselves, to protect our iman, and 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 develop ourselves. And that's a sign of, I think, spiritual and just maturity in general. You know, where do you want to be? Where do you want to be? And you can't do it in a bubble. You may have to help, you know, your your wife and your children and your whole family to be centered around your vision and their vision as well. It's all like bring, elevating everybody together because we can't do it alone. And that's where you have to have really, really good company and really good people around you. Um, but yeah, so I just want to thank you so much for, for, this, uh, for this opportunity because even you just raising the question and me attempting to be slightly authentic or hopefully authentic enough to answer it by saying, I'm in this kind of limbo situation has maybe wakened me up to take things a little bit more seriously and just to refocus again, you know? So Zakra here, guys. Well, I'm eternally grateful. I'm eternally grateful. But yeah, but take it seriously too. Uh, write down your vision. Maybe I'll yeah. check up with you next week. See, I mean, let's check up. Let's take each other to account, man. Let's oh. see if we, we yeah, let's do that. Mm-hmm. We've got each other WhatsApp uh-huh. messages. Let's say, what are you doing with your fitness vision, with your spiritual vision, with your relationship vision what's going on what have you done what are the three main strategies what, what are the actions you're doing on a day-to-day basis let's do that yeah let's take to each other let's Inshallah. do that Inshallah. Inshallah. Allah got us from Allah so you know any any bit of value that you got from this any of the viewers watching everything's from Allah so use that into account and just realize that Allah does love you and do what you can every day to get closer to him and not farther and not t- stay stagnant because I'd rather go one step forward than just stay the same mm-hmm. Man, I bless you, man. I bless you guys. I mean, I mean, subhanallah. This episode, wallah, it's been it's been so real, subhanallah. I was just like sitting and, and thinking, you know, about my own my own goals and everything and my conviction in them and all that, subhanallah. And it reminds me of something that my um my sheikh mentioned yesterday. He said, when you look at the difference uh between the person who who's 99% uh sure they want to do something and they, they give it 99% effort and conviction and take that person compared to the person who's a hundred percent sure they're going to do it and they have a hundred percent conviction the entire neurochemistry is different the entire brain scan is different and just that little sliver of one percent of not fully being convicted a hundred percent in what you're doing gives room to that procrastination that excuse that so on and so forth and as you mentioned having yakin is so important for everything we do in life and that's why it's so important for for muslims to be convicted in la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah in islam and their deen and also what to, they're working towards and be convicted in their goals so i wanted to add that at the end because subhanallah it's one thing to make a goal but some people wallah, they, they, they struggle just to start it and they struggle to maintain it because they don't have that that certainty that this is what mm-hmm. i'm going to do no matter what Oh, I struggle with that myself. So. Maybe, maybe we should do a follow-up podcast in six months to see what's happened since. That'll be epic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inshallah. Inshallah. It'll be a you know roundup for the year of 2021. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. We're going to be diesel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how about this? Before we wrap this up then, um, let's all come up, come up with three goals that we have. So in six months when we do, we can check in and we'll remember this. This is proof. Proof is in the pudding because we're putting this out there. So I'll let uh, Brother Rami go first, inshallah. Yeah, that's what, subhanAllah. Um, how specific does it have to be? It could be general. It could be specific. It's, it's up to you because you're you're only accountable to yourself and Allah. So yeah, yeah. I want you to watch this in six months and be like, okay, tick, tick, tick. Okay. Not somebody else. And you know. 
Okay, alhamdulillah. I want to have a body that's closer to the, the body that I want in terms of muscle mass and everything. I want to put on some weight. That's why I asked about how specific, you know, 10 pounds, 20 pounds, so on and so forth. So I want to be closer, inshallah. That's one goal. Second goal, I want to increase myself in my Islamic knowledge um, and also, you know, in Tazkiyah, humble myself. And you now I'm going to make it to two different goals. One, in my Islamic knowledge, my application of that. And, and secondly, my te the Tazkiyah aspect of it, humbling myself, keeping the ego down, um, and, and just being the best person I can be in my character and being closer and, and more similar to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Those are my three. All right, Fayyad, back to I like that. Me? All right, bro. Bismillah. So one, have be closer to the body I want. So right now I'm cutting. So maybe 150-ish pounds, right? Uh, so that's going to be one. Number two, uh, memorize at least five surahs that I don't know, right? So this, this has been a big goal of mine. I've been speaking to Rami couple nights you know here and there just yo how do i memorize quran how do i at least start with memorizing quran right i learned tajweed at a young age you know reading translations and all that but not being you know a native arabic speaker you know it's something it's a goal of mine and to spread you know islam and do dawah you must understand islam to understand islam you must you know know the quran so that's one goal that i have so i'll be two number three mm. Honestly, man, two is two is big for me right now. But number three, I would just say make position my business because I do online coaching, right? So fitness and all that. So position it in a way where I'm making the standard that I had for myself set for this year, right? So I had that set for the end of the year. So alhamdulillah, the way it worked out in the conversation, six months from now, it would be at the end of the year. So just reach that goal, um, help, you know, through the grace of Allah, transform hundreds of lives. That's it, bro. You know? MashaAllah. Yeah. MashaAllah. Hamza, you want to go first or you want me to go? Oh, it's up to you, bro. If it if, depends if you want age to go before beauty. <laughs> ah, nah, nah. If beauty goes first, go ahead, bro. No, nah, it'll be you then. <laughs> that would nah, be you. I'm, I'm actually 42 years old. <laughs> what? Yeah. No, you're not. I'm playing. I'm playing. I can't say what lie. I can't say what lie you do that. <laughs> um, we, we should we should have him guess our age. Oh, well, man said 42 of all ages. Yeah, because he because he's 41. How old are you? Yeah, 41. I'm I'm, I'm 40. I'm, I'm gonna be 41 in September, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. How old does he look though? If you didn't know, he's uh he's he's uh 19. It, honestly, the the grays. In your beard lets me know that you're like later 30s. But if if that was like fully black, I it's not gray, bro. Isn't that just a skin? Yeah, it was a skin. Yeah, it's not gray. Ah, okay. Yeah. Well then but to me, that's how it looked like. But if I see you in person and I would have seen that was a skin, I see you like maybe 31, 32. 31, no, 32 max. Yeah. Yeah. Rahi, uh brother no, Hamza, how, how old do you, would you think Angel is if you didn't know he was 19 years old? Mm -hmm. Uh you know, it's very hard to tell on Zoom, to be honest. And, you know, the thing with age, it's so, so it's like, what does what does a 30 year old look like these days? Like, I've seen 38 year olds, they look 50. And I've seen some 38 year olds look 25 or something, maybe. Mm. Well, you know, something like that. So, you don't, you're definitely young. You're definitely in your 20s, right? Yeah. I'm playing. He's not 19. But, <laughs> yeah, but you are definitely in your 20s, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, correct, correct. yeah. Rami you, was 19 guy, when we started the podcast. You guys are all young, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe yeah. I'm 23, could, Rami's 20, right? 21, 25, 26, yeah. So from the 21 to 26 region. Yeah. yeah. Mashallah, man, Allah bless you guys. So, uh, yeah, so beauty first. Go for it, bro. <laughs> all right. I just got ahead, bro. So if I had to choose three things in six months, number one is I want to fully be able to go spearfishing. Uh, this past weekend, I was learning how to free dive. You know what free diving is? Uh, is it basically just... No, I don't actually go and tell me. It, it's it's just diving underwater, but like with no scuba tank or anything. And some people can oh, stay underwater. Wow. Yeah, some people can stay underwater for like 10, 12 minutes at a time. And um, I want to be able to perfect that so that I can go into the water with a spear gun and basically hunt my own food. Um, I think that would be just the most i don't know just a different experience to be able to do that number two um i would love to be back at it into the mma 
I recently, before Ramadan, I took a break from MMA because I had a groin injury. And I'm like you. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to train around it. I'm going to train around it. I did that for like six months. And it, the injury just got really bad to where I could barely oh, walk. Shit. Yeah, so um, inshallah, inshallah, I will be healed and I will be doing MMA again. And then the third goal that I have that I'm going to be setting here is I'm going to make it a priority to be spending at least minimum 15 minutes after prayer, each prayer, to just sit down and self-reflect and just be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that time. Because I feel like sometimes I'll hit the prayer and like, I'll just be like, oh, I got to do this and I'll finish the prayer and then like go off and like start doing things again. And, and I just feel like that just adds to like a lack of presence, a lack of mindfulness. And I don't know, it's kind of disrespectful. It's like, oh, well, let me get this over with instead of like, well, let me actually worship my creator. You know, so those yeah, are my three. Beautiful. I just want to say one thing that uh, I was I was ex I was extending my gratitude gra gratitude towards uh, you know Brother Hamza to Sheikh Abu Alia, right? When we had him on, and we were telling him, you know, like man, you know, Ustad Hamza had a, had a huge role, you know, alhamdulillah, through you know me getting on Dean and all that, and I was telling him all that, and he's like, bro, you're saying this before you even like met him, like spoken to him. You're saying this just seeing his videos. Wait till you see him in person. He's like the real deal. I was like, nah, was no, no. So, Sheikh Abu Alia is a very, very special human being, honestly. Very special human being. He's right, uh, man. He's right. Because I honestly lost track that we've been talking for three hours right now. No, and I remember, you know, Sheikh Abu Alia, my love, preserve him. I've actually, because I lost my phone, I lost my SIM. So, a lot of the contacts, I've, uh, I need to get his number again. Uh, hopefully, it's, it's somewhere hidden in the WhatsApp. Well, I'll messages. just message you on WhatsApp after we're done. Yeah, yeah. So with yeah. Sheikh Abu Alia, he's the one who revived the kind of understanding of the kind of the four spiritual diseases of the heart and how to deal with them. And so he's been a huge inspiration, which really is one of the most important things we should be talking about in our current age, because all of our actions are, are a derivative of our state of heart. And even if you do the right action, but your state of heart is not correct, then there will be no barakah, there will be no true success from that perspective. So, yeah, so, you know, Yanni, maybe he was being a bit charitable about who I am, but he is, uh, he's a very, very special human being, and I bless him, and he needs to be promoted more, absolutely, because mm -hmm. the stuff that he has is, is extremely enriching for everybody, so may Allah preserve him and grant him and his family the best in this life and the best in the life to come. Oh, but no. um, uh, in terms of your Salah thing, bro, what's really powerful is, uh, uh what one can do in order to create that presence maybe is to uh, lengthen the shujud, right? So lengthen the, the sajda um, and just maybe be uh, more, uh, take the prayer, be, take more time in the prayer. And the way to do that is, is to start with wudu because it's got to say that your prayer starts at wudu time. You know, wudu are like, you know, really fast. I think mm. I knew one guy, he could, do, he could do wudu in like 25 seconds or something or 30 seconds, which I think is really fast, yeah? Um, do wudu and also look what's the inner dimensions of wudu. I'll, you know, the person said that when you're doing wudu, it's like your, your sins are being washed away. So just, just know that's the fact, that your sins are being washed away. You're preparing for one of the greatest acts of worship, which is salat. And then when you finish your wudu and you do it properly uh, with, its own, with, its, with, with its due right, uh, you know, in the right way, then you go into salah. And then when you go into salah, obviously salah, because we did it five times a day, it becomes very me mechanistic. So what we need to try and figure out is be in the state of mind or presence from the wudu to understand what I'm, what I'm doing in the first place. I'm here, I'm worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm fulfilling an obligation. I am glorifying Allah. And try and learn everything that you say in Arabic in the prayer and understand it, the meaning. And also uh, uh, develop a sense of khushu, a sense of humility and heartbrokenness and an awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the different stages of the salah, when you're standing, when you're in sajda, when you're in the ruku, understand what these mean. You're bowing to the Lord of the heavens and the earth, to the King of all kings. You're putting your face onto the, onto the floor, onto the ground, which is like, you know, the face is the symbol of the ego, that you're really nothing in reality. You know, when you 
peel away all of your kind of identities, like even the fact what your name is and where you came from and your job and your titles and you remove all of that stuff. What's left? Really, really, what are you? You just you're just an abid. You're just a worship of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Yeah, and it's through that humility Allah will elevate you. So get into the kind of what you call the inner dimensions of, of the salah and get an appreciation and a feeling of that in your salah. Um, and because sometimes it can become mechanistic, you know, Allahu Akbar. You know, you know, even the concept Allahu Akbar, right? Allah is greater, not the greatest, Allah is greater than anything you can imagine, anything in the universe. Allah is greater. Even the very fact that we say Allahu Akbar, we should internalize within ourselves that you know Allah is worthy of the greatest extensive praise you can imagine. Because if you could praise like martial artists and poets and thinkers because of their attributes, whether it's writing, whether it's athleticism, whatever the case may be, if we could praise them by virtue of their attributes and their attributes are diminished and flawed in some way, they're limited in some way, then what, is it, what, what does it mean how we must praise Allah, whose names and attributes are perfect and you know, maximally perfect to the highest degree possible? So it means we should give Allah the greatest extensive praise, right? You know, we could praise the, the mind of a scientist what about the one who created that mind? We could praise, you know, uh, an athlete for his strengths and ability. What about the one who created that athlete, right? He, Allah is deserving of greater extensive praise because of who he is, right? So, you know, Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater. Imagine internalizing all of that just when we say Allahu Akbar. I know that's hard, but you should have a program to try and develop that in your salah over time, yeah? And obviously there's going to be peaks and troughs. Sometimes we get busy, sometimes this happens, so... Sometimes it's going to be a bit faster. We, we may not be in the right state of, of mind or state of being, but always have in your mind that I want to I want to be present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'm going to lengthen my salah a little bit more, lengthen the sajda a little bit more, be a little bit more focused in each position and understand what it what it what it really means and the impact it should have on me, and understand everything that I'm saying in the salah from Surah Al-Fatiha all the way to the the du'as that you make and so on and so forth. Once you start developing that slowly over time, your whole salah will change. And even, you know, making du'a to Allah in sajda, the Prophet said that the closest you are to your Lord is in sajda, so supplicate to him. You know, some people make du'a straight away after salah, right? I, I'm not gunning that, but it's equivalent in some way of hanging up the phone on Allah and just sending him a text, <laughs> right? Because the closest you are is in sajda, right? So, you know, Supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I do appreciate there is difference of opinion in the madahib on uh, you know, whether you can do it in English in, in, in the sajda or if it's specific Arabic du'as or even if you could make du'as in your fara'id prayers. So I know there is an ikhtilaf, so I'm not claiming to say that there is one position here or anything. But the point is in general, you know, supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in sajda. You're closest to your Lord uh, in that state. So... So yeah, but yeah, it was beautiful. May Allah bless you guys. Oh, it's my turn. Uh, <laughs> I was like, no way. I was like, yeah, no, you're not scared. He's like, all right, guys, uh, until next time, six months. Uh, mm. Yeah, you know, look, to be very authentic, it does require more thought. But this is my intuitive kind of um, intuitive mm. thing. So the first thing I want to do is I want to keep every single goal and commitment that we said to people in Ramadan, what Sapiens Institute is going to achieve. So we said things like we're going to, uh, have four academic debates uh, we're going to have over 60 videos uh, we're going to have uh, 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 published I think three books we're going to have we're going to train and develop over 10,000 people we're going to have 10 new professional courses on our learning platform for free and other things so these are quite big goals we're going to have a book on doubts right dealing with doubts all the main doubts you find online and also strategies on how to deal with doubts. So, you know, all of this has to happen by Ramadan. So within the next six months or so, I'm going to try my utmost best, inshallah, with the will and help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get the team motivated and inspired to achieve all of those goals. That's the first one. The second one thing, the second thing is, is to do a deeper study of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to, to go through the whole of the Quran, from a tafsir perspective, multiple tafsirs, but also to do tadabbur, right? I think that's very important. And, you know, I used to have a, a Quran, I used to always highlight things that jumped at me, jumped at me. And the whole thing was highlighted almost, right? 
And in that process, it helped me a lot with tadabbur, because tadabbur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that do they not reflect upon the Quran or the locks on their hearts? So you can mirror the meaning that the more tadabbur you do, the more your heart becomes unlocked to receive his guidance and mercy, right? So I want to do that, right, in the next six months because it just has to happen. The du'as have to be connected to the Qur'an, not in a superficial way, but in a much deeper way as well, yeah? Not only tafsir, but also tadabbur and pondering because it is through a lot of pondering that you get a lot of answers. And even when I wrote my book, some of the stuff with regards to some arguments or enhancing some positions, uh, was based on just reflecting on the Quran. But I, you know, I'm at a stage where definitely has to be far more deeper and far more focused, right? And obviously I can't do that myself. So that means I have to be connected with specialists, connected with ulama, because, you know, people who are not connected with the scholar, scholars or students of knowledge, those people are very dangerous people because there's no one around them to basically keep them in check and make sure um, that they're, they're doing what they should be doing and, and they are who they should be. So I have to connect with, with those girls. That's the second one. Um, the third one, intuitively, what comes to my mind is, um, yeah, uh, memorization of the Quran. That is probably, if anything, has been my greatest weakness as someone who calls people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Definitely, definitely memorize good chunks of the Quran and keep that as a spiritual practice continuously. Not just, oh, I'm going to learn this for now, use it in the Tao or whatever, or I'm going to try and learn it just for myself. Um, you know, do it for, 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 for lofty goals, that you're glorifying Allah, you want light in your heart, because the Quran is like a light, right? And also you want to do it so it enriches your Tao and it helps other people as well. So memorization. So those three things. Fulfill all the goals that we, we said we were going to achieve last Ramadan uh, for, for this year up to next Ramadan and inspire, touch, move, and inspire the team to achieve that. The, the second thing was do a thorough study of the Book of Allah, multiple tafsirs, but also tadabbur, and be connected with the people to facilitate that process. And the third one was the memorization of the Book of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, yeah, let's, let's keep each other in check when it comes to that. Let's do that. <laughs> Inshallah. 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 All right. And everybody at home as well, set goals for yourself now. So when that episode comes out, you can hold yourself accountable as well. And if you feel comfortable, then comment down your goals, your three goals for the rest of 2021. I'll like all the comments, respond to them, and we'll keep each other accountable, guys. We're all one big ummah, one big family. It's the least we could do. Zafra here, guys. You've been uh, inspirational. Um, apologies for maybe more of a laid-back Hamza. Um, nah. It's just... It was, but, yeah, that's so, the vibe with our podcast perfect. we don't yeah, have like good. a lecture style yeah, we like no, just I, yeah. so if, I, i'm only saying that if your expectations were something else so but th this is me this is uh, the chilled out conversational mode may allah bless you guys you've probably brought the best out of me to be honest so and it's been it's been tr very transformative so it's uh been that much needed kick that i needed to be honest zafra here for that Likewise, honestly, mashallah, the, the discussions we've had were honestly uh, life changing. Uh, and that's 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 me, you know, saying it as an uh, that, that's an understatement, frankly, subhanAllah. Um, like, I'm, inshallah, I'm going to watch them back and, and, and reflect on it even more. As you said, the uh, is, is really important. So, Habib, may Allah bless you immensely. You uh, too, Zahra, for the opportunity. I mean, Ya Rabb. Any final words from the brothers? Just we appreciate you. We appreciate we everything we really that you do, do for the Uma. Yeah, make dua for us. Um, we've made many mistakes, so uh, there's lots of tobin that needs to be done. And uh, inshallah, may Allah accept even the small things that we do. And all we need, really, all we need yeah. is the mercy of is the mercy of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So let's make Amen. ourselves eligible for Allah's mercy. And may Allah bless you guys. Keep up the great work. And um, yeah, and and stay who you are. Because it's great. I'm actually going to be watching your other episodes now because I don't think I've ever seen an episode of your podcast before. So I'm just going to check them out. I'm going to check out Sheikh Abu Alia because he's always got, he always has something amazing to say and transformative and, and, and very insightful. Lots of basira from him, you know, deep, profound wisdom from the Sheikh. May Allah preserve him. And also Sheikh Fahad. Check him out as well. Inshallah. Yeah. Inshallah. All right. SubhanAllah. Jazakallah khair. May Allah bless you immensely and the brothers with me. 
Uh, with that being said, Allahumma atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adhaab nar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. There was a guy who asked the sheikh, it was an atheist by the way, how are you going to feel if you die and you find out that, you know, there's no day of judgment, there's no heaven and hell, how are you going to feel? And the sheikh answered, I'm not going to feel as bad as you would when you find out there is. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I'm not saying religion is fear-mongering and Islam is fear-mongering, but if you don't want to have fear of a love, your creator, and you want to be logically sold on religion, there's a lot of intellectuals, Hamza Zortzis, Muhammad Hijab, there's too many people, Subur Ahmed, too many great scholars, too many great advocates of the truth, too many great cosmologists, too many great physicists, too many great even students of knowledge like Rami that are just out here doing their due diligence. So open your eyes and inshallah, God willing, you are guided to see the truth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not change the condition of a person until they change what's within themselves. So if you guys don't change what's within you, you're not going to get Allah's guidance. You're not going to get that. Yeah. Yeah. SubhanAllah.